The Andy Griffith Show, starring Andy Griffith, with Ronnie Howard. Also starring Don Knotts. It is interesting that we see our sin issues as there's a reason for why they exist. We see with what we struggle with, well, Pastor Chief, you need to understand my past. I had this issue. Now, you see, you don't understand the family I come from. And, you know, this was traditional, and, and this is the family I have, and that's why I have those sin issues. We see our sin that way, but we see other people's sins, we see them as huge moral failures. We see them as, there's no excuse for that type of action. We see them as things that need to be judged. And we're going to watch a, about a 90-second clip here. And it is Andy and Barney sitting there, and they're going to discuss other people's management <laughs> issues. They're going to discuss other people's drinking problems. And they're even going to discuss other people's morality problems and talents. All the while, while they are gossiping. <laughs> enjoy the irony and enjoy amazing acting by Don Knotts. Hi, Miss Burton. Miss Burton. She's a sweet little woman, you know that. Yes, she is. Never complains. Never once have I heard the tiniest complaint from that woman. Have you, Ange? I can't say it. I have. What's she got to complain of? You kidding? Sam. <laughs> All the time. You don't mean it. Oh, don't strike a match if he's breathing in your direction. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Howdy, Dick. Dick Renneker. Hi, Dick. He's got his hat on. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> he must have heard on the radio where the wind might be coming up today. You know, I wouldn't wear one of them wigs for all the money in the world. <laughs> I'd live in terror. I was going to get caught in a sudden wind. <laughs> Hmm. Myra Kuntz from the lingerie shop. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's the matter? What do you mean? You're looking at Myra and smiling funny. Oh, well, I was just thinking, you know, you know the story that's going around. About it. No, what story is that? Well, you know. No, I don't. What is it? Oh, come on, you know. I don't know. Tell me the story. Well, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. It's just gossip. You know how I feel about spreading gossip. Barney, come on. Tell me a story about Myra. <laughs> well, <coughs> what they're telling about her is... Oh, wait a minute. Ben Weaver's waving at us. Hi, Ben! Anyways, Myra. You know, I don't think that's a friendly wave. I think he wants us. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Come on. You want us, Ben? You darn right. I called, but there was no one in your office. No, we've been doing our policing on the street today. What's wrong? Well, plenty. I'm being robbed. Robbed? Well, why didn't you say so? Run away. I'm not being robbed right now. I mean, it's not that kind of robbery. Well, I just mean that things are disappearing from the store. Well, when did you notice it, Ben? Well, just a minute ago. I went to get a silver tea set that we had, and it was gone. I started checking, and there's lots more things missing. Well, somebody's walking off with that stuff. That's what's happening. Now, you think I need you to tell me that? Come on, let's go inside, Sheriff. Business has been pretty good lately. People have been in from all over. Uh, you just put your mind at ease, Mr. Weaver. This is just a routine police matter. Lock the doors, Andy, and I'll line them up against the wall. All right, you fool! Oh, Don't start! You want to ruin me? Well, do you want to break this case or not? Just, just take it easy. Let's get back to our lesson. I just find that so funny. But what they are doing, they are really <laughs> illustrating there's acceptable sin. In the middle of discussing everybody else's moral failures and vanity and other social problems that they have, 
They're doing what we sort of call acceptable sins. And, and as that man kind of came over frantically waving, I kind of feel like that's my job today. To sort of, while you're in the middle of doing your acceptable sin today, your churchy okay sin, I feel like it's me and my job to come over and kind of wave at you and sort of get your attention today. Our main very moment, if you're taking notes, is this. All my life needs to be scrutinized by God's word. All my life needs to be scrutinized by God's word. Now let me give you a couple things about gossip. Our lesson isn't about gossip, and it's not even about this other particular sin we're going to compare it to. But let me give you a couple things. Old Testament, Proverbs 20. There's so many things about it, but here's just one. Whoever goes about slandering, revealing secrets, therefore do not associate with a simple babbler. Uh, here's another one. In, in 1 Timothy 5, I'll just read you the last part. And not only idlers, but gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. Um, we do not, what we do is we compartmentalize sin. We break it down into categories. And listen, every sin has a different outcome. But we compartmentalize it. We go, this is really bad. That's a horrible thing. Well, this is not so good and not so sad. Well, this, you know, it's kind of, come on, this is America. This, this just sort of happens. And we compartmentalize sin. If you're taking notes, this is very important. There we go. All sin does not have the same consequence, but is still wrong. Uh, it, can I just, you get a speeding ticket. That's sin. It's a mistake. You murder someone. In Texas, they execute you, all right? You would not want to be executed just because you were going five miles over the speed limit. But both are breaking the law. Amen? Amen. Both are sin. The consequences are different. Listen, lying to, on your tax uh, forms is a sin. Lying to your wife when she says, Does, you know, do I look... You know, lying that moment, it might still be a sin, but the consequences are going to be different. I think God gives special grace and dispensation for husbands. Only in that area. But... Um, but let me just stop for a second. Romans chapter 1. The majority of that chapter will deal with alternative lifestyles. You'll see what I'm talking about. If you've been in the church long enough, you know Romans chapter 1 deals with an issue that we deal with today in our society. It was a big cultural event. And by the way, no society has ever lasted with open uh, issues like this that are just culturally and socially accepted. The Romans ended when they opened it up and said it was fine to do and they culturally accepted it. No society has ever survived when they come to this point morally when they say, fine, go ahead and do this. It's not a big deal. And by the way, just a side note, you're not supposed to say this and you'll get people mad at you because there is no answer. Um, they were born that way. That's the exact same thing the people from NAMBLA say, North American Man Boy Love Association, who are in favor of the men and small children engaging in physical activity. They say we were born this way. That's the exact same thing every child offender, that's the exact same thing they say. I was born this way. Now, they may come a time when they find that gene, there may come a time when they say that, that, well, you have a genetic predisposition and stuff. But people are born with in, in issues and tendencies. Long line of Irish drunks. I know that drinking would be putting a gun to my head. I know that I follow the family pattern. That does not give me an excuse. Amen? Amen. I was born this way. Well, that's the exact same thing other people say also. Um, but with that in mind, Romans 1 being about that particular issue, watch how this ends. Just, just grasp this. I'm going to throw this up here. Romans 1 does this. This is the end of talking about all of this. It says this. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetous, malice. They were full of envy, murder. Remember, what, this is the context of what he was talking about to the Romans. It's murder, strife, deceit, malicious. Man, these are really bad people. And they've already done this. And then he ends the verse with this. They are gossips. The Apostle Paul, with all of this, and with what Romans chapter 1 is dealing about, that horrible sin, he just sort of at the end goes, all this bad, 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 horrible, horrible, and he throws this in too, and they're gossips. What we like to do, we select which issue will outrage us. Barney and Andy, sitting there in the police car, we sort of see it, and it is funny, but I'm, I'm talking about it, but... They're sitting there, and what they're doing is gossiping. And God puts it on the same level 
He talks about it in the same, and it's still sin. If they were sitting there in the police car smoking crack, we'd be like, oh, I can't believe they were doing it. But yet, it's gossip because, well, you know what? Those are sins we like to do ourselves. I want to give you an example and keep it on that same vein of, of, of that issue that I'm sure most of you have don't struggle with. Many of you probably don't know too many people with it. But on that same issue, I want to give you an example of what we like to do. Galatians 5. These are, I'm going to give you a couple verses that basically say these people aren't going to heaven. Let me give you a couple verses here. You'll see, it, you'll see that something's missing. All right, Galatians 5. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Impurity, idolatry, sorcery, eminent strife, rivalries, dispensation, dis dissensions, divisions, envies, orgies, and the like the, like these. I warn you as I warned you before that you do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, that sounds like a good list of people who aren't going to heaven. And it's basically Paul saying if, if you're doing these things, you're not saved. There's no way you can be involved in these things and stay involved. That's the key. Stay involved for a long period of time and be saved. But what I did is I kind of pulled out some other things that, well, maybe those aren't as good. Uh, sexual immorality. Stuff we look at on the internet. Pastor, it's, it's just couples live together now. It is too much to expect our young people to be pure before they get married. But sexual immorality. Um, jealousy. How about sensuality? Can I stop there and talk about how ladies dress? Sensuality, jealousy, none of us have ever been jealous. How about fits of anger? Well, no, but see, I hit my hammer on my thumb. But you don't understand my son. He really gets on my nerves, and not mine. <laughs> but fits of anger. Uh, how about drunkenness? America's pl plagued with, you know, I realize that in our country today, there will be a year, there will be somewhere around a thousand or so deaths because of guns. But you realize every year there's over a hundred thousand deaths as the result of alcohol? We just, oh, okay. We just, it's normal, it's acceptable. Let me give you another example of what we do, how we categorize. Here's First Timothy, kind of the same thing. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless. And... For the ungodly and sinners. Yeah, those are horrible people. And the ungodly and the profane. Yeah, get them, but God get them. For those who, their fathers and mothers, for murders. And the men who practice homosexuality. Oh, that's disgusting. We hate that. That's horrible. And enslavers. Yeah, people who enslave other people. That is bad. And perjurers. Yeah, I would never commit perjury because nobody's going to put me on trial. And in accordance with the gospel and the glory of the blessed God, which I have entrusted. These are people to stay away from. These are people, but I skipped over things that we uh, disobedient. Uh, I, I, hey, if you're a parent of a teenager, let's pull this verse out. All of these other categories, disobedient. Uh, how about that strike their fathers? That's what it says. They, 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 how about sexually immoral? Again. It's great when God deals with those people in San Francisco. But God, don't you talk about my sexuality. Um, how about other things? Liars. It's okay to lie a little bit. Uh, or whatever is contrary to sound doctrine. See, we'll focus on these groups. They're not going to heaven. But when the word of God is put up to ours, not mine. Not my issue. And here's really the one of the most famous, and we'll be in 1 Corinthians 6 today. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? These people aren't going to seven, or aren't going to heaven. Do not be deceived, neither the let's skip over that one. Nor idolaters, yeah, that's not us, nor adulterers, it's probably most not most of us. Nor men who practice homosexuality, that's gross, disgusting. I hate that. Ooh, gross. Nor thieves, yeah, keep someone stole from me, I hope he does go to hell. Nor the, let's skip that, nor the, let's skip that, nor the rivalers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But again, in context of all of this, again, see, we don't have a hard time of looking at the people walking down the parade and, and, and the city parades in San Francisco and just the ridiculous and going, look at that, there's no way they're going to heaven. But yet the young couple who kind of experiment before they get married. Sexually immoral. How about the greedy? 
I mean, we talked before about materialism a few uh, weeks ago. Greedy is the center of our economy. And how about, again, drunk <coughs> Not mine. It, it, it's, it's true, these are bad things, Pastor Steve, but not mine. What I want you to do today is how to see your sin. How to see your sin. And you do sin, amen? amen. You are a sinner. And if you are not a sinner because you sin, you sin because you're a sinner. How does God want me to see my sin? All right, you're taking notes. Number one, there we go, as something God can change. Verse 11, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 6. I've had people in the ministry and pastors and stuff say uh, that homosexuals can't, alternative lifestyle people can't get saved. Not possible. Uh, reprobate mind, God gave them over. Impossible. And, and everything. But verse 11, right after all of that horrible list, look what he says. Paul says to the church at Corinth that got everything wrong. I'll throw it up on the screen. And such were some of you. All that long list of horrible things that they were and how they acted. Paul says, you used to be one of them. And by the way, Christian, let me just remind you. There, but for the grace of God. You didn't have that father. You didn't have that mother. He said, but there's no excuse. And I'm not making excuses for it. But when you don't, listen. When you have an overbearing mother and a father who is absent and leaves you, it will alter your lifestyle. It will alter your thinking. If you have, listen. When your mother does things to you as a young boy, it will damage you drastically. It's not an excuse. But we need to be careful and sort of, that's their sin, but ours is different. They were. Some of you need to remind yourself of what you used to be. But look what it says. But you were washed. We're, we're, we cleaned ourselves up, right? We got a bath. No. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified by what? By the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. Let me just tell you what verse 11 implies a few things. Number one, it implies everyone has a past. And such were some of you. I don't understand everyone's issue. I don't understand gambling. If everyone was like me, there'd be no casinos. How do you literally go in there and just hand over your money to people? If you would like to hand over money to people, see me. <laughs> we'll put up a dartboard, and you can gamble on that. You can a hundred to one odds. Some of these things are, and people, and this hand it over to a group of people, people who are making millions and billions. People who complain because their profits are only in the millions. They complain because of that, and we just. And I don't understand, it, but I know that in this room. That may be an issue for somebody. Also, everyone has a future free. Look at verse 11 again. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name. Now let me just give you this if you're taking notes. There's a difference between justification and sanctification. Justification takes place at salvation. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, you became justified. Just as if you never sinned. God no longer saw you your sin. He no longer saw you the way you were. He saw Jesus. You were covered in the blood. Amen? But sanctification is a lifelong process. Sanctification is kind of like a water treatment plant. I've, I've seen them. They smell horrible. But they take dirty water and they dump it into a vat and they have these big things that come through and they clean out big things. And then they take the water and dump it into another vat which is smaller and they clean out smaller particles and smaller and smaller and smaller until so finally the government says there's an acceptable level of fecal matter for you to drink. They do. But that's what sanctification is. It's the process, hey, I got saved with all of these issues, and God through His Holy Spirit, God through His Word, God through my church, God through the preaching, God through my pastor, God through the elders, God through the deacons, God using all of these things He's given us and gifts us starts shifting through our lives, and those big things start coming out. Those big issues start. And then He starts dealing with the smaller issues and the smaller and the smaller, until finally He comes down to a Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and starts talking to you about gossip. Number three, everyone needs Jesus. Verse 11, and the Lord Jesus Christ and by His Spirit our God. Salvation is a free gift. It comes down to Jesus. Now, I am for counseling. I am for medication. I am for people having something. There's chemical imbalances. There's issues you're facing. 
It's medicine. I am for all of these things in your life. But I am first for you going to Christ with it. That's right. The doctor is great, and I want you to do it. In fact, even if it was cancer, I want you to see your doctor for cancer, whether it's depression or cancer. You need to go see your doctor. But I first want you to go and spend time with Jesus on it and talk to him about it and see what he would have you do. And maybe he will step in and heal you, or maybe he'll heal you through your physician. Number two, see my sin as something with an origin and a destination. Um, an origin and a destination. Ephesians 5, again. Uh, I, I, don't want to, I don't fully understand this, but repeatedly God connects physical actions and the way we walk. Uh, verse 5, it says this, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude jokes, which are out of place, and instead there be thanksgiving. Again, there's a connection between the way people talk and the way people act. I've noticed this. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexual, immoral, or impure, or who is covetous, just in case you thought you got out of it, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Um, young people, everything starts with a start. Everything starts with a beginning. No one plans on, on taking their first sip of alcohol thinking, well, this is going to let me be a drunk. No one does that. No one takes their first joint thinking, well, this is just going to let me be a life of nothing. No one takes their first shot of cocaine, or snort, you know, whatever. No one does their first heavy drugs. No one does this thing, well, this is going to destroy my life. But everything has a start and a beginning, and everything has a destination. Um, I love this. I, I, this was at... Uh, uh, Pacific Garden Rescue Mission. I know it's an old phrase, but I heard it there again, and it's stuck in my mind, and it's this. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Every now and then, you need to pull weeds out of your own garden. And number three, how God wants me to see my sin uh, as something that could help other people. Matthew chapter 7. If you want to flip over there real quick, feel free to. But I'm going to throw it up here on the verse on the screen. Matthew 7 is also a passage about judging. I almost posted this on somebody's Facebook wall because they had mentioned about, don't judge me, and I commented, well, no, you need to fully understand what this is talking about. We use it often about judging, and here's what we usually use, just the first verse. Judge not that you be not judged. Everybody who's doing wrong knows, don't judge me. You're judging me. Oh, judging and we use it as, oh, you can't do it. But in contrast, let's, let's, in context, let's read the whole passage. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you measure out, you will be measured. All right? It sounds like, hey, don't ever tell anybody they're doing wrong. Don't ever point out anything in a brother's life or a sister. I mean, that's how it's always used. I'm doing wrong. You're saying it to me. Hey, don't judge me. I got to get out of jail free card. Don't you look down your nose. Let's put it in context. Let's actually read the next few verses. Um, the next verse says this. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eyes, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Why shouldn't I judge? I shouldn't judge if I'm struggling with the same issue. I shouldn't judge if there's a big issue in my life that I need to take care of. Specifically, listen, you're struggling with alcohol. It'd be very difficult for me to go, you know, I've noticed you, know, you were buying Budweiser and stuff. Well, I'm getting loaded on the weekends. You're struggling with, you know, I notice, I think, you know, young man, that you're, you know, you're messing around with your girlfriend, and I just don't think you should be doing it. All along on my computer history, don't look. That's what the verse is talking about. You've got a speck, but I've got a beam. What does it say? Or how can we see, say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and there's a log in our eye. But why? Why should I take care of all of this? Because ultimately, God does want me to invest in your life and care enough about you to point things out. When I get my life taken care of, I'm supposed to then turn around and in the spirit of help, in the spirit of help, try to help other people. Because here's the verse that never gets talked about. <clears throat> you hypocrite. First take out the log out of your own eye. Why? Why? And then you shall see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. The reason I'm not supposed to come to you with my own sin issues and my own problem 
is that I need to take care of it, not just for my own good, but when I take care of it, now I can deal with the issue you're struggling with. I can see it clearly for your benefit. Nobody ministers to alcoholics better than people with an alcohol problem. Nobody ministers to addicts better than people with an addiction. Nobody ministers to single moms better than people who are single moms. I need to look at my sin as a way that I've struggled with and I've dealt with it and I've taken it to the cross. I need to look at it as a way that I can now minister to someone else. Amen. This, as I close, is Cy Rogers. I encourage you to YouTube him. I disagree with him on some spiritual gifts issues. But I, I love listening to Cy Rogers preach. He makes me feel bad every time. Cy Rogers, maybe you can't notice from there, uh, but there's, I, there's other pictures I didn't want to put up that he does show when he speaks, um, is a former alternative lifestyle person. In fact, there's pictures of him in gender uh, assignment changing. He was dressed as a woman. Got saved. You know, he got, got saved particularly through two people who were living together immorally and started to read the Bible and then called him and said, what we're doing is wrong, we've separated, and we've accepted Christ as our personal Savior. And that's one of the things in his testimony. But what he has done, he has taken his issue, he has taken his sin, and he has turned it around and used it as an opportunity to preach to people and speak to people about a huge issue that the church is very blind to. And I want to show you a little video clip of him. Some of it's funny. I just thought it would be good for you to see. But how God took his issue, his sin, and used it so he could even reach his own dad. Bring uh, upon him. And, and he just said, my son is dead and I don't want to see the woman you think you have to be. So the fact that my dad and I got reconciled is no small miracle. And not only reconciled, but I had the privilege of leading that man when he was 79, five years ago on Father's Day weekend. I got to lead him to the Lord Jesus and baptize that man myself. God proves himself to be bigger than broken relationships, and that's why in your own history of broken relating, you give God opportunity to write more chapters because it's not the rest of the story. You fall down, you get up, you get dirty, you wash off, just don't quit. I'm glad I didn't because if I had given up, I wouldn't have seen the redemption of God in the story of my parents. Your past is an opportunity to minister to other people. But before that can happen, you have to deal with your issue. You have to hold up God's word and his spirit and ask God to show what needs to change. Not mine. Not mine.